I'm Jay Jermaine Bay of Adonia Morris Pradium, Ante Colorado. The acronym is AMPAC. I'm the Chief Judge of Compton Court. Uh, today is Class 98. Class 98. Uh, what did we learn in Class 97? Well, we started learning a little bit more about a case commonly known as the United States of America versus Burton, right? Rodney Burton. So Rodney Burton referred to himself as Rodney Burton Bay, right? So your brother Rodney was standing on this square. He was using every last skill set he had that he had learned about being a Moorish American, right? And the end result was what? He was still incarcerated. So therefore, what, what do we take away from that particular case? Well, we understand that good brother Burton, uh, Burton Bay, was checking every box, right? But we all know that every last Moor has been doing the same thing for decades, right? So each one of the Union states, as well as the United States, you know, dealing with their federal government, they already know exactly what the Moors are going to say in advance. As soon as you say you're a Moorish American, they know the next 10 steps you're getting ready to take with them, right? They're already prepared, right, to go ahead and find you guilty. But they know that you're going to waste the court's uh, time, but at the end of the day, you're going to end up doing time unless you take a plea bargain, right? So like I said, a lot of Moors are on a conveyor belt straight to jail. And it's because the Moors have been miseducated. Right? And with that miseducation, unfortunately, there's been adjudication and then people are being incarceration, right? It's dealing with incarceration, right? So the only way for us to change this path that we've been on is to course correct. We, we have to unlearn what we've learned. And what is it that we have to replace it with? We have to replace it with well settled principles of international law. And what is international law? Well, international law is a combination of not only treaties and conventions, but it's also our own constitutions. Constitution is regarded as international law, right? So after that, we have to study the United Nations Charter. We should study world history regarding other states' constitutions and how other states get into relations with other states. We have to study these things, right? So at the end of the day, we have to unlearn what we've learned. Now, for the record, uh, I want to say uh, thank you very much to good brother Taj Tariq Bay. If it wasn't for Taj Tariq Bay, there would be no J. Jermaine Bay, right? And we all know there would be no Taj Tariq Bay without Noble Drew Ali, right? So, you know, I want to give credit where credit is due. I first started studying and learning from Taj Tariq Bay on his videos in the year 2018. I watched them all through 2019. I watched them all through 2020, and for the most part, I watched them all through 2021, right? Because I was interested in learning, but one of the things that Taj would continue to say is, don't believe me, do the research, right? And I'm a research guy. Another thing that Taj would say is, hey, more should go and establish their own study groups, right? And we need to continue the teachings and the learnings about what it is to be a more. And that's one of the things I set out to do is to start a study group, right? And through my, through my study group, I continue to study myself because the best student is actually the teacher. The teacher has to take the time to study the material and, 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 and come up with a curriculum on how they're going to actually present that material and have a good understanding of it. In order to, to teach it, you must understand it, right? And not just understand it, simplify it, right? So I want to give credit where credit is due to good brother Todd Sharif Bay. Uh, by no means, uh, you know, through AMPAC study session, is it, is it a, a critique in terms of it being a negative critique of Taj B. Bay? Uh, but at the same time, like, like Taj would tell you, the truth does not require an apology, right? So uh, I'm going to keep talking about these truths. Uh, it, Taj B. Bay has, what, 10, 20, 30 years of history that we can go back and watch his videos and start to critique what it is that he sh he's taught and what he shared and what was the result, most importantly, of what it is that he taught. And unfortunately, I hate to say that a lot of Moors ended up, you know, dealing with a lot of legal disputes that found themselves losing their houses, cars. Uh, they lost their jobs. They lost their children. A lot of Moors lost their freedom. And the reality is, you know, when you study the United States of America, you study their several states, they allow Moors to get a win from time to time. Right? They allow one more to win. You know, 100, 99 more will lose and one more will win. And that one more will go to YouTube and say, I beat him. 
And next thing you know, that one more is like Pied Piper. Everybody's falling with that one more dig because he got to win. It's like somebody at the gas station winning a scratch off and the gas station puts a big sign in the window. This person won 25,000. So everybody runs that gas station because they say that's where, the, well, that's where everybody wins with that scratch off, right? So when you deal with the United States of America and there's several states, they allow Moors to win under what's called discretionary. From time to time, they let Moorish Americans win. That way, Moorish Americans will stay on the wrong path because they know that Moorish America is in a status of fellowship instead of scholarship, right? So don't ever think for one moment, just because you win a little case with the United States or with one of the several uh, member states, that you actually have done it the right way. Because reality is this, you wasn't supposed to be in their courts in the first place. Imagine that. So your win means absolutely nothing because you wasn't supposed to be in their courts. If you're in their courts, that means they still consider you a citizen of the United States of America. So therefore, when we start to beat the United States through our own council courts, that's a real win. Other than that, hey, just chalk it up to say you was one of the very few that they allowed a discretionary win, right? That's what we must understand, all right? So, like I said, we're going to keep talking about these truths uh, because the truth will set us free, right? Okay, let's go ahead and get into class. Okay, so as Moors know, we always open up the Constitution. Constitution is paramount. The Constitution provides us with what's called protections. The Moors don't understand that ever since 1880, right, after the Sultan signed a multilateral treaty with the Europeans, including the United States of America, in 1880, the Sultan signed a multilateral treaty, commonly known as the Madrid Convention, Article 15. And Article 15 had two paragraphs. Whereas the Sultan agreed through a treaty, which is law, international law, it gave the Moors two decisions. It said you can choose to return and consent back to a Moroccan government in the empire, or you can choose to remain as a naturalized foreigner, right? A citizen within a foreign country. But in order to stay in that foreign country, you still got to come back to Morocco and still get permission from the Moroccan government to remain in a foreign jurisdiction. For example, a lot of Moors right now, especially Moorish Americans, who got one foot in, one foot out of the jurisdiction of America, don't realize they have to pledge their consent back to a Moroccan government. They have to pledge consent and they have to prove it. And that's the key. You have to prove it, that you pledged your allegiance to a Moroccan state, and that you renounce and denounce any naturalized status from the United States of America. You must reject them in writing. And that must come from a competent state, because the state's got to recognize the more. And then the state, after that, does the work on your behalf. The national of the state doesn't send the foreigners anything. Your state represents you, and the state sends it on your behalf because the state is representing you. That must be understood. So, since 1880, the Moors have not been able to prove that they have returned to Morocco, but yet they always knew something was wrong, and they were always seeking, seeking a solution. Right? We've tried some of everything. Black Panthers, you name it. Nothing has worked. Why is that? Because Moors don't realize that the treaties have given the United States of America permission on the Treaty of Madrid, Article 15, Paragraph 2, allowed the United States of America to have their civil and criminal jurisdiction over all nationals of the United States of America. How did Moors end up becoming nationals of the United States of America? It's because of A, the 13th Amendment, B, the 14th Amendment, C, the 15th Amendment, D, the Naturalization Act of 1870, Chapter 62, Section 7. So therefore, the United States of America's internal laws turn the Moors into citizens. 
All their internal legislation caused the Moors to become citizens on paper. That's called escheate and hypothecation, right? But then the Sultan turned around and did what? He confirmed it. The Sultan confirmed the naturalization status of Moors in the Treaty of Madrid, 1880, Article 15, Paragraph 1 and 2. The Sultan confirmed it. He gave the United States of America and the other 12 signatory powers permission to hold the Moors in a naturalization status. But he also gave the Moors instructions, just like Dorothy had instructions to click her heels three times. The Sultan left a provision in the Treaty of Madrid for the Moors to click their heels three times and immediately they come back to Morocco. What about Morocco? Keep in mind, when Dorothy went to Oz, she left from in the middle of the street to begin the move. When she clicked her heels, she found herself right back where she left off. So the Moors aren't going anywhere. It's an act. Through legislative act, you consent on a document to return to Morocco. You're already standing in Morocco. But it's about jurisdiction, and jurisdiction is set forth with paperwork. The paperwork must come from your state. It's about jurisdiction. And jurisdiction is established under one word called state. And what establishes a state? A constitution. So without the constitution, there's no state. Without the state, there's no constitution. So if you have no constitution, then now all of a sudden now you're standing in America. So when you pledge your consent to return to Morocco, immediately you're now standing in Morocco again. Just like that. Just like Dorothy. Dorothy bumped her head. She got caught up. She was spinning. You bumped your head. But now you must come back into the consciousness of understanding there was a set of instructions no different than a Rubik's Cube. The average one of us, 90% of us, have never taken the time to read the instructions on how to figure out a Rubik's Cube. You know why? Because we're just not that interested or we don't have the patience or the discipline to read the instructions. But we all know there was instructions that came with the Rubik's Cube. Life is about instructions. If you don't follow instructions, more than likely, you're going to fail. Right? So we must read the instructions and the instructions the whole time was in our treaties. Keep in mind the treaties Precede Nobudra Ali. Nobudra Ali established the temple in 1913. All the treaties came out before 1913. Nobudra Ali had the same responsibility to follow the instructions of the treaties the same way we do in the year 2023. And more, it's just simply a more. We all obligated to return back to Morocco according to the Madrid Convention of 1880. Noble was born in 1886. Noble was born right into a naturalization status because of the Treaty of 1880. It made no difference what the United States internal legislation is. Guess what the treaty says? If treaty is supreme law of the land, that's where you put your focus. Don't worry about their constitution. Worry about the treaty because the treaty is about who? Moors and Morocco. So Noble was born right into a naturalization status. That's the reason why he said we're descendants of Moroccans. Born in America. How were we born in America? We were naturalized into a jurisdiction. We came out and, like Dorothy, we ended up in Oz. How do we get back home? You click your heels three times. What's the clicking of three times? Come back to three branches of government of the state. And once you consent back to the state, all of a sudden now, you back in Morocco. Just that easy. It's just that easy. But we never understood the due process or what's commonly known as repatriation or expatriation. We never understood the due process. We never understood the administrative reforms 
that we need to do for ourselves. So we'll keep talking about that today, right? We'll keep pointing out our problems, and then we'll point out solutions, okay? Let's continue. Okay, so as the Moors know, we're still going over the United Nations Charter of 1945, uh, Chapter 6, about the Pacific Settlement Disputes. Right now, the Moors have an internal dispute called nationality. We've got a, a, a name crisis on our hand, right? Identity crisis. We got to fix it. Well, how do we fix it? Well, we fix it with first education. But the reality is, is what is the education all about? It's about pointing out your treaties because when in doubt, pull out the treaties, and the treaties already set forth what your nationality is. But unfortunately, the Moorish American teachers did not teach us about treaties. You hardly hear Moorish American teachers going through the Act of Algeciras of 1906. You don't see them teaching about the Treaty of Madrid and its 18 articles. Why is that? If treaties supreme all the land, why were we not studying the treaties? Why are we not studying international law in the fullest understanding of what that's all about? This is international law on how to deal with a dispute. And right now we got a dispute about nationality and how to declare our independence. All right? So let's study some more about that. How do we settle the dispute of nationality? Okay. I'm going to show a video. The video is about the good brother Il Malik Shabazz, commonly known as Malcolm X. Right? Let's go to the board. What, 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 are, what are we going to learn from the good brother? Well, first of all, we're talking about the Charter of the United Nations, Chapter 6, Article 33, about the Pacific Settlement of Dispute. But today we're going to learn a little bit more about what good brother Il Malik Shabazz was talking about in the 60s, okay? Here, 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 here we go. Il Malik Shabazz, i.e. Malcolm X, was on a path to independence in nationalism, right? Nationalism, and through the United Nations organs. Malcolm studied Africa and China's statehood claims of independence and acts of decolonization. Let's read again. Il Malik Shabazz, i.e. Malcolm X, was on a path to independence and nationalism through the United Nations organs. Malcolm studied Africa and China's statehood claims of independence and acts of decolonization. Now, do y'all think it's a coincidence that Malcolm, i.e. Ilmalik Shabazz, was hanging out in Egypt? But who else came from Egypt? No, Ju Ali. Right? So every time our people travel abroad, we come back brand new. Timothy Drew went to Egypt, came back Noble Drew Ali. Malcolm X went to Egypt, came back Gilbert Lee Shabazz. Every time you go across the waters abroad, you come back with knowledge of self to understand it's about you need a declaration of independence. You need a constitution in order to decolonize. Noah Draw Lee comes back and he's talking, he's waving a Moroccan flag. He's telling us that we're Moors. He's hanging out with dignitaries all of a sudden on an international level. Malcolm was the same way. He comes back, Ilmali Shabazz. Now all of a sudden he's hanging out with dignitaries all of a sudden. This was in the 60s. So let's learn a little bit more about what Malcolm, the path that he was on before he was assassinated because he was getting too close to the answers to the test. But Moore's never picked up the torch right when he failed. It's been over 60 years we haven't picked up the torch. Let's listen. Now before I start the video, Malcolm is going to talk about this word nationalism. No. Nationalism. Noun. Identification with one's own nation and support for its interest, especially to the exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations. 
Their nationalism is tempered by a desire to join the European Union. Similar are chauvinism, jingoism, flag waving, eccentricism, ethnocentricity, uh, advocacy of or support for the political independence of a particular nation or people, Scottish nationalism. Similar are separatism, secessionism, isolationism, secretarianism, and patriotism. All right, thank you. So we're going to listen to Malcolm. He's going to keep using his word nationalism. He's also going to talk about independence, right? Nationalism, identification with one's own nation and support for its interests especially to the exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations. Next section. Advocacy of a support for a political independence of a particular nation or, or people. What did we learn about the word political? That means state. You need what? State independence. So nationalism, the world calls a nationalism movement. What does a nationalism movement mean? People now declaring their independence through statehood, right? And after that, they enact what? A constitution. That's what nationalism means. It's a step-by-step -step process to seek political independence, right? Let's listen to Malcolm. So this video right here, the name of it is Malcolm X's legendary speech, the ballot or the bullet, okay? All right. I'm going to start it at approximately the 14 minute and 30 second mark. We're going to listen to about five minutes, okay? Really pay attention. will balance your blood sugar all day long. Put one drop under your tongue after you eat, and die back. Once you change your thought pattern, you change your, your attitude. Once you change your attitude, it changes your behavior pattern. And then you go on into some action. As long as you've got a sit-down philosophy, you'll have a sit-down thought pattern. And as long as you think that old sit-down thought, you'll be uh, in some kind of sit-down action. They'll have you sitting in everywhere. <laughs> It's not so good to refer to what you're going to do as a city. That right there, castration. Right there it brings you down. What, what goes with it? What Think of the image of a, someone sitting. An old woman can sit. An old man can sit. A chump can sit. A coward can sit. Anything can sit. Well, you and I have been sitting long enough, and it's time today for us to start doing some standing. And some fighting the back there. When we look like at other parts of this earth upon which we live, we find that black, brown, red, and yellow people in Africa and Asia are getting their independence. 
They're not getting it by singing, we shall overcome. No, they're getting it through nationalism. It is nationalism that brought about the independence of the people in Asia. Every nation in Asia gained its independence through the philosophy of nationalism. Every nation on the African continent that has gotten its independence brought it about through the philosophy of nationalism. And it will take black nationalism that to bring about the freedom of 22 million Afro-Americans here in this country where we have suffered colonialism for the past 400 years. Did you hear what he said? The man said this in the 60s. He understood what it required for us to decolonize and required independence. At the time that good brother Malcolm was hanging out in Africa, it was approximately 33 independent African states. And they taught him the ways of how to proclaim independence. This is why he came back with such confidence, right? When you see Malcolm with the beard, that's Il Malik Shabazz. When you don't see the beard, that's Malcolm X, the black man. He left the black man behind. He consciously came more of an independent thinker, a critical thinker, to understand how to uplift fallen humanity in a competent way. He understood the plight of the Africans of what they did to decolonize. He knew it wasn't about bullets. He knew it was about the pen. This is why he was on his way to the United Nations. And what have we done to pick up the torch from where he fell? Nothing. All we've done is, is written writs and affidavits. We've done everything internally where he was on his way to do something externally. What does externally mean? On an international level instead of on a civic level of dealing with civil rights. He knew about human rights on an international level. Next thing you know, he's gone. But guess who he talked to before he left? Martin Luther King. And Martin Luther King comes out and say, yeah, you know that whole thing I did when I have a dream? Yeah, that was a nightmare. He said it. His most iconic speech, he turned around and said, that's not a dream, that's a nightmare. I've miseducated the people. He knew it. He knew it wasn't about integration. He knew it was all about nationalism. He knew it was about independence. He knew it was about constitutions. If you go back and listen to Martin Luther King, he started talking about even before the Constitution was written, we was here. Before the Plymouth, Plymouth landed, we was here. He started talking out loud. Next you know, he's gone. They knew his next step was what? To pick up the torch where Malcolm left off, i.e. Ilmalee Shabazz. Next thing you know, two Kennedys are gone, all in the 60s. Why? Because they knew what Malcolm and Martin wanted to do. The Kennedys had a pen. They had power. Next thing you know, they're gone. Why? To stop the momentum of nationalism in Morocco. To stop the movement of independence in Morocco. You must understand, boys, this is not a game. But you must educate yourself and educate those around you. That way, this knowledge that Malcolm tried to share with us will never, ever, ever be silenced again. We are stronger together. But we can also be very weak together as well. And we've been very weak for decades since Malcolm left and Martin left. We've been weak as a people because we've been trying to enforce civil rights and talk about enforcing the Constitution. That ain't nothing but civil rights. That has nothing to do with international law. So if Malcolm knew this, and he comes back and now he's Il Malik Shabazz, and he's talking about going to the United Nations to follow in the footsteps of China and the Africans, Martin knew this, the, the, the Kennedys knew this, 
How are we going to sit here and say that our own people didn't know about this over the past 60 years, especially with the internet? A lot of our people knew the answer to the test. They just refused to enforce it. I want to say thank you to good brother Il Malisha Bags. I thank you for having courage, good brother. And I want you to know something. We will continue the good works on the path to the United Nations. That's a guarantee. So instead of us going to the United Nations and finishing the works of good brother Noel Jawali and good brother Emily Shabazz, what do we do? This is the case of the United States of America versus Rodney LeVon Burton Bennett. Here's what we ended up with in, 2020, in the year 2021. This is what we still do. Look at what's happening here. Do you see what's happening? You see what I highlighted? It was the United States court. And then it was the United States of America as the person. So the person and the United States court. So the states, the states, the state and its representative of the court came in and prosecuted Rodney LeVon Burton. They have a state. They have a court. Okay, where was Rodney LeVon Burton's state? Where was his court? Where was his representatives? Because you know there was prosecutors involved with all this. Where was the Moors? Where was Rodney LeVon Burton Bay's representative? Where was his consul general? Where was his minister of foreign affairs? Where was his ambassador? Keeping in mind that the good brother told them that he was what? I'm a free, free, sovereign more, but he couldn't prove it because he failed to consent back to a Moroccan state. Then he turned around and said, I'm internally in the jurisdiction of his ancient Moabite forebearer. Okay, what jurisdiction? Because jurisdiction is defined by what? A constitution and a state. So everything he's saying right now is patently frivolous and arbitrary and capricious. Why? Because he can't prove it. That doesn't mean he's not a Moor. He couldn't prove that he's a Moor. It's about proof. He had no protections for someone to come in and prove it for him. So just like Il Malik wanted freedom, so did Burton. But Burton was found guilty, right? But watch this. The courts pointed out that Burton had Moorish beliefs. Why did he say he had Moorish beliefs? Because he couldn't prove who he is. Let me ask you a question. When you look at your mother, you do you look at your mother and say, I believe that's my mother? Or you say, I know that's my mother. So when they say the Moors believe, they say these Moors can't prove who they are. So they believe who they are, but they can't prove it. You got to see what they're doing here in these court documents. So Rodney Burton had Moors beliefs because he couldn't prove that he was a Moor. What else? Then they turn around and say, you need to take a psych evaluation because you think you're somebody that you are not, sir. You are not Burton Bay because you can't prove it, number one. You're not a Moorish American because there's no such thing as a Moorish American, even in the treaty, because he was trying to enforce the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. He couldn't show them in the Treaty of Peace and Friendship anywhere it said Moorish American or Moorish or any type of Moorish American title whatsoever because he said he was a Moor American. Okay, where's that in the treaty? It don't exist. And the treaty said it was state on state. It was Moroccan state of the empire and the United States of America. Where was Burns represented from the empire of Morocco? And here's what he's arguing. Here's the catch. Burton filed several affidavits with the district court arguing in part that he was not a citizen of the United States and that the court therefore lacked jurisdiction. All the more say this is a knee jerk. Knee jerk response. Okay, Burton, if I could ask him a question, since you say you're not a citizen, I got no problem with that. You can say that. Okay, prove it. Where's his constitution? Can he show a birth record from his Moroccan state? 
Does he have Moroccan identification? Where's the representative to come in and provide all that documentation? It don't exist. So therefore, even when he said the court lacked jurisdiction, the reality is the court definitely has jurisdiction. Why? Because of the Treaty of Madrid, 1880, Article 15, Paragraph 2. Again, the United States of America, jurisdiction over Moors who what? Who are, been, who are still naturalized in America, who have failed to return to Morocco through a proper reinstrument who have not pledged their allegiance back to a Moroccan state government and Moroccan laws. What was he supposed to consent back to? For example, Ampac's constitution provides what? Protections, just protections for Moors in Morocco. For Moors in Morocco, for Moors in Morocco, the constitution provides just protections. Why? Because we have what? Established, we have established laws. Regarding what? Our state. So if Rodney Burton was a national, as example, Rodney Burton Bank was a national of AMPAC, AMPAC would have obligations to come and do what? Represent him. For example, listen. Brittany Griner. Brittany Griner is a citizen of the United States of America, but more specifically, she's a citizen of the United States International Organization. Even though quiet is kept, you can't be a citizen of a corporation. We'll talk about that another day. But Brittany was locked up in Russia. What is Russia? A state? So who represented Britain? Listen. The United States. What does it say at the bottom? Biden speaks on WNBA star Brittany Griner's release. Who's representing Britney? Her representatives from what? The de facto state. Keep in mind, de facto means what? A fact. So Here's the president, vice president, and you know they probably had ambassadors, Minister of Foreign Affairs, consul generals representing Brittany over in Russia. So they got an embassy in Russia. And all the representatives of the United States was at that embassy representing Brittany Griner. Okay. Okay, Burton. Who's representing Burton? Because he said, he said he's not a citizen of the United States. Okay, Bert, you're a citizen or a national of what state? You got identification that proves that? Can we contact your embassy, consulate, or your state? You say the courts of the United States lack jurisdiction? Well, prove it. Don't just say it. What's happening? Listen. Moors love this right here. Constitution of the United States of America, 1789, or the, or the Constitution of the United States International Organization of 1871, 1871 is false. Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1. The Moors love this. But yet the Moors don't understand it. Okay. What was Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1 about? It says judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the law of the United States, and treaties made, or which shall be made under their authority, to all cases affecting ambassadors or public ministers and consuls, to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, to controversies to which the United States shall be a party, to controversies between two or more states. So, United States of America, or more specifically, the United States International Organization, had what? A dispute with who? Russia. So it was state on state dispute. The United States were representing Brittany Griner. Brittany Griner wasn't representing herself, she had representation. Compe 
content representation at that. Elected officials that was representing three branches of government of the United States International Organization. So, okay, Bird Bay, tell me, since you say you're not a citizen of the United States, then tell me what state <clears throat> did you come from? Well, now you can say, okay, United States of America, you guys' constitution says, Article 3, Section 2, if there's a controversy between two or more states, then what do you do? You bring in who? You bring in ambassadors, ministers, and consuls to do what? Oversee the due process of treaties. And then within the treaty, it's going to say which court has jurisdiction. So our bilateral treaties with the United States of America says who has the judicial power? It's consular court. So my question of burden is, tell me the name of your state, then tell me the name of the minister, consul, or ambassadors who are representing you, and then tell me what did they do next based upon the, those, those common authority to enforce the treaties on your behalf. It don't exist. And guess what? These list of names didn't exist for them either. Documentary evidence as an example. Taj Bay went to jail. Light Bay went to jail. Sharon Bay went to jail. Jamal Bay went to jail. Lamont Eel is currently in jail. Rodney Byrd Bay went to jail and is still in jail. Now, and I say this respectfully because this is an impact study session. We're here to study, right? We have to figure out what we did wrong so we can fix it. When Taj went to jail, what state did he invoke? Did, did Taj follow since Taj keeps saying enforce the Constitution? Okay, Taj. Tell me about Article 3, Section 2, which part of this you invoke, Taj? That's my question to you. What's the name of your state, Todd? And tell me the name of the ambassador, Mr. Foreign Affairs, or Consul General that represented you when you went to jail. And tell me about the due process of what they did as the common authority to oversee the treaties. And more specifically, tell me that you petition the judicial power of the Consul Court to deal with your traffic ticket. Tickets. Like he said, he had like 38 tickets. <laughs> Todd, you've been telling us to enforce the Constitution. Did you do it? The answer is what? No. Okay. Let's look at his students. Okay, did Light Bay, every time she went to jail, did she follow Article 3? Section 2, Clause 1? No. When Sharon Bay went to jail, did she follow Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1? No. When Jamal Bay went to jail, did he enforce the Constitution, Article 3, uh, Clause 2, Section 1? Or should I say Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1? Did Jamal enforce that? No. Lamont's currently in jail. Lamont said he's the Consul General. Now, wait a minute. Let's not laugh at Lamont, because guess who commissioned or gave him the confidence that he's, he can be the consul general. You know who did that? Tashmi Bay. Lamont just woke up one day and said, I'm going to be the consul general of Morocco. He, he self-appointed himself. And guess who turned around and said, that's what's up? Taj Bay. Now Lamont gets arrested, but yet true de jure Consul generals have what's called privileges and immunities because they're the common authority of their state. They can't be touched. They have qualified immunities, like a force field around them. They can't be touched. But yet, 18 sheriffs jumped on good brother Lamont Hill on video, and then the Moors turned around and put that video on YouTube to show the whole world that a so-called consul general got detained. Don't you know that would have been a, 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 a violation of international law? 
That violates the customary norms of international law for any representative of the state that has privileges and immunities to be detained or arrested. But the United States didn't care that Lamont got locked up and it was going to be on national TV or whatever. Why? Because they know Lamont ill is what? His status is patently frivolous and arbitrary and capricious. He's not the competent authority of a state. Ask Lamont, what is the name of his wazir of his state? Or prime minister or president or sultan? What is the name of the legislators of the legislative branch of his state? Who is the speaker of the house, Lamont Hill? What is the name of the judge of your judicial branch? Right? Because... Moors keep talking about, especially good brother Lamont, and I say that respectfully, he loves to enforce the Constitution. Okay, Lamont, did you enforce the Constitution? Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1, did you do that? The answer is no. We're failing as Moors. We've delayed our own justice because we don't follow instructions. Why don't we follow instructions? Because our Moorish American teachers haven't showed us the instructions. At the same time, our Moorish American teacher said, don't believe me. Do the research. And Moors haven't been doing the research. So since we don't do research, what happens? Things like this is what happens. You got third-party interlopers who pop up and start to control the narrative. This is Arby Bay Publications website. It's technically an e-commerce platform. That's all it really is. It has some information, don't get me wrong, some history. But technically speaking, when you first open up something, you look at a newspaper or magazine, the first thing you see is what gravitation, that's what they really want you to know, right? For the magazine, okay. As soon as you open up, what's the first thing you really see? Order by money order. It's about money. It's about what? Selling books. That's why it has books, 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 books. You will never get your independence with a book. International law is free online. Go Google it. You want to know something about international law? It's free. You want to download anything from the United Nations? It's free. You want to study something with the United States of America? All their stuff is public. It's free. None of their stuff is in a book. Constitutions is not a book. The United Nations Charter is not a book. Legislation is not a book. Three branches of government is not a book. A book is what? Literature. Government is what? Legislation. Moors don't know the difference between legislation and literature. This is our problem. We're miseducated. We're too busy studying books, reading books, and writing books. We've delayed our own justice, but, here, but, but check this out. Like I said, as soon as you open it up, what's it about? There we go. That's what it's about. All about finance. Finance, finance, e-commerce platform. To sell you information about your own history. If we love each other as brothers and sisters, why are we charging each other to tell each other something that we all need to know because we're all in this together? This is shameful. What else is shameful? Okay, here's some classes. So you come down here and talks about these classes, right? Talks about these classes. Okay? Look what it says right here. After the proclamation update class on 329-23, we return to our regularly scheduled classes where a contribution is necessary to enter the class. See, they had done a few classes for free. Now they're going to go back to charging more again. This is shameful. You got to pay a contribution 
in order to enter to learn about you being a moor? This don't make sense. What did your mother or your father or your uncle charge you to have a plate of food? You're supposed to feed each other. Now, listen up, especially the Wazirs, Sayarahas, House of Duazi, Consul General, all the Kazi judges. Listen to this. I'm going to start right here. Our publications put this on here recently. They said, definitely no need to go anywhere or set up Moroccan states when the entire state has been opened up because they operated on the doctrine that was void then and avoidable. Now, Article Publications is publicizing that you don't need a Moroccan state. APAC study session has 98 classes packed full of reference points. Our debate publications won't show you any cross-reference of what they just said or why you don't need a Moroccan state. They won't prove it. They'll just say it because they know Moors are in fellowship instead of scholarship. My challenge to our debate publications is this. Prove what you just said, that Moors don't need a Moroccan state. Prove it. Prove it. Don't just say it. Prove it. Also, let me say this to all the consul generals, take a screenshot of this, please, on your computer and save it for further evidence for the future. This type of foolishness is going to stop. This is an act of genocide. Nobody Ali said, be careful because you're going to pull you back into slavery. Even the United States of America's 13 colonies had a declaration of independence and then they wrote a constitution. Every state on planet Earth has a constitution. And this e-commerce platform is telling you, you don't need a constitution. You don't need a Moroccan state, but the whole world operates through states. This is an act of genocide. And this will stop. I don't promise you. I guarantee you. What I have up here on the board... Moors all know about this. This is the 1906 expatriation document. 1906 expatriation, right? Citizenship abroad, protection abroad, right? Moors are familiar with it. We always say go to page 459 and 460 to learn about Morocco. But on this document, okay, according to the PDF, I'm on page 10, right in the center, 10. This is what we're about to read is about proof. Rodney Burger could not prove who he was. It's because we were not taught to follow instructions about what all states do on planet Earth. This is why you need a state, Moroccan state. Because a state is obligated to these reforms or administrative due process to assist you with what we're about to read. Okay? No, but can you read this uh, first paragraph from here to here? Uh, Department of State, December 15, 1906. Honorable Robert Bacon, the Assistant Secretary of State. Sir, by an order dated of July 3rd of 1906, the undersigned were constituted a broad to inquire into the laws and practice regarding citizenship, expatriation, and protection abroad, and to report recommendations for legislation to be laid before Congress. Pursuant to the recommendation, of the Committee on Foreign Affairs of the House of Representatives contained in the report of the committee dated on June 6th of 1906. Okay, now keep in mind, we're talking June 6, 1906, right? Around the year 1906, right? What happened in 1906? Act of Alcaceres. Act of Alcaceres, right? So now they're having a, a, a uh, Constitutional Assembly. They're talking to the Senate. They're talking about ratifying the act out of Sarah's, and after that, putting it into full force, right, in effect. So now, you go back, now they're talking about how you put together legislation, dealing with what? Expatriation, right? Or how to deal with protections abroad by their citizens. But today we're gonna learn about expatriation, 
right, or repatriation, okay? But it's all about legislation. Keep that in mind. They're talking Congress. This is what the Moors got to learn. It's all about the pen. It ain't about your mouth. It ain't about your verbal decrees. It's about your government, three branches of government working side by side, checks and balances. All right, so we're going to start here, okay? Now we're on page 11. We left 10, now we're on 11, according to the PDF. Okay, we're going to start here in the highlighted area, okay? Hey, uh, as to the second point, we recommend A, the passage of an act declaring that expatriation of an American citizen may be assumed. First, when he obtains naturalization in a foreign state. Second, when he engages in the service of a foreign state and such service involves the taking of an oath of allegiance to such state. Third, when he becomes domiciled in a foreign state and such domicile shall be assumed when he has resided in a foreign state for five years without intent to return to the United States. But an American citizen residing in a foreign state may overcome the presumption of expatriation by competent evidence produced to a diplomatic and consular officer of the United States under such rules and regulations as the president shall prescribe. Pause. Okay. So what are we reading right now? This is about them putting together legislation on how you become an expatriate of the United States. Right? It's all about evidence to prove that you're an expatriate. But let's make this more germane about Moors. Listen, this third section, when he becomes domiciled in a foreign state, and such domicile shall be assumed when he has resided in a foreign state for five years without intent to return to the United States, but an American citizen residing in a foreign state may overcome the presumption of expatriation by competent evidence. You see the word competent? Notice how they keep using that word all the time in international law? Okay, well what's competent evidence for Moors to show that we immediately returned to Morocco? Okay, now you gotta show them what? Law, isn't this what they talking about? Legislation? Law, right? Your constitution is the first semblance your constitution is the law of restoration. It's the law of return. It's the law of expatriation. What about expatriation? You an expatriate of the United States of America. Now you a what? Repatriation back to Morocco. So it's expatriation from America and repatri repatriation back to Morocco. Through what? Competent written history. This is the competent authority. This is the competent evidence. This is what Malcolm was talking about. This is what Il Malik Shabazz was talking about. What is nationalism about? What is independence about? Constitutions. It's about a restoration. You must restore your land back to Morocco. Let's continue. So what is evidence about? Okay. Let's talk evidence. Okay. Let's talk evidence. What do the Moors need as evidence? Right? Because the United States created legislation that says people got to show evidence that they're no longer what? American. Burton could not prove that he was no longer what? American. Burton had the obligation to prove that he was what? Moroccan. Well, how do you prove that they're Moroccan? Well, you need evidence. You need proof. This is what, in this same document, now we're going to read about Morocco. The Moors have read this a thousand times, but did they truly comprehend it? Okay. This is uh, from the top, though, from the top. Mr. Philip charged the affairs to Mr. Root, Secretary of State, on August 3rd of 1906. Pause. What happened in 1906? Act of Algeceres. Act of Algeceres. Continue. American leg Legation, Tangier, August 3rd of 1906. Sir, 
There are, strictly speaking, no Moroccan laws relating to citizenship of Moorish subjects in Morocco. Pause. First sentence. Did Moors understand the first sentence? Okay, let's break it down. Sir, there are, strictly speaking, strictly, strictly, strictly speaking, no Moroccan laws relating to citizenship of Moorish subjects in Morocco. So, obviously, you need Moroccan laws in Morocco for more subjects, but what are, what, what, Moorish means what? Moroccan. So you need Moroccan laws in Morocco for Moroccans. How the heck do we turn into Moorish Americans if the first sentence says Moroccan laws in Morocco for Americans? This don't make no sense. From the top. No. There are strictly speaking no Moroccan laws relating to citizenship of Moorish subjects in Morocco. The fundamental laws of this non-Christian country are based entirely upon the Islamic code, no parts of which treats of the subject of citizenship. Paul, so in 1906, None of our treaties said that we were citizens of America. All of our treaties, including the 1880 Treaty of Madrid, said that we are naturalized in a foreign country. But we had the obligation to return to Morocco with a pen and consent back. But even our own treaties never said we were citizens of the United States. United States of America. They said we were naturalized. It's a difference. It's about words more. Meaning that we was on a protectorate status of the United States of America. We got adopted. They were protecting us. Let's continue. Uh, there are, however, numerous treaties and conventions between the various Christian countries and the Moorish Empire by means of which citizenship in this country is defined. Pause. Do we understand that sentence? Okay. There are, however, numerous treaties and conventions, such as the Treaty of Madrid, 1880, is a convention, Madrid Convention, between the various Christian countries and the Moorish Empire, by means of which citizenship in this country is defined. So what do they mean by, by means of? of which citizenship in this country is defined. So within the country of what? The United States. How is the United States defining citizenship for who? Moors. You know how they define it? Okay, 14th Amendment, right? Naturalization Act, right? And what else? They understood the Madrid Convention of 1880, Article 15 said what? Let's go to it as a reminder. What did, what did Paragraph 2 say? It said, foreign naturalization heretofore acquired by subjects of Morocco according to the rules established by the laws of the United States of America shall be continued to, to the United States of America as regards all its effects without any restriction. So therefore, Mr. Philip, Hoffman Philip is saying, let's take from the top. There are, however, numerous treaties and conventions between the various Christian countries and the Moorish Empire by means of which citizenship in this country is defined. So in the United States of America, they're using the 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment, Naturalization Act, and all of that got secured by what? The convention. Treaty, Treaty of Madrid, which is Madrid Convention, secured the fact the Moors could be what? Subjects. Subjects. Subjects, right? The Moors are subjects. Subjects. Right? Subjects in a foreign country. And that foreign country, each country, foreign country, can maintain its laws, established laws. The United States of America was establishing laws civil and criminal jurisdiction, and all its effects, all its effects, without any restriction. 
Why? Because more than what? We acquiesce. See right there? We acquired. They acquired the Moors' consent. It's called tacit acquiescence. Why? Because we didn't follow the instructions of paragraph one. Paragraph one was the instructions. You want to figure out the Rubik's Cube? Follow the instructions. Dorothy wanted to go home. The good witch said, follow instructions. Here's the instructions for more to go home. Paragraph one, and then there's paragraph two in case you don't. Come back home. Let's read paragraph one. No. Uh, right of protection in Morocco of July 3rd of 1880, Article 15. Any subject of Morocco who has been naturalized in a foreign country and who shall return to Morocco shall, after having remained for a length of time equal to that which shall have been regularly necessary for him to obtain such naturalization, choose between the entire submission to the laws of the empire and the obligation to quit Morocco unless it shall be proved that his naturalization in a foreign country was obtained with the consent of the government of Morocco. Right, so if you don't follow this first paragraph and return to Morocco and choose between the entire submission of the laws of the empire, right, if you don't do it, then the United States is invoking paragraph two that says foreign naturalization heretofore acquired, acquiesced by subjects of Morocco because, because they didn't follow paragraph two. Now they're what? Obligated to the rules established by the laws of the United States of America and shall be continued to the laws of the United States of America and all its effects without any restriction. Okay, let's go back to Hoffman Phillips. There are, however, numerous treaties and conventions between these various Christian countries and the Moorish Empire by means of which citizenship in this country is defined. So they talk about these treaties, they talk about the convention of Madrid that defined, defined how the naturalization is being invoked against the Moors. You gotta understand this Moors. This is the United States of America has civil criminal jurisdiction over us through our own treaties that said right of protections. Right, right of protections in Morocco. Go back to the treaty, 1880. It says right of protections in Morocco. So who's protecting us in Morocco? Paragraph two, United States of America is protecting us in Morocco. Hmm. Under their what? Laws, their established laws. Are you seeing this, Moors? Okay, let's go back there. Take it from top. There are, however, numerous treaties and conventions between the various Christian countries and the Moorish Empire by means of which citizenship in this country is defined. But, as I understand from the above acknowledged instructions, that it is not the desire of the department to call for a report upon such lines. I will therefore confine these remarks to general conditions existing, which may possibly be of some use in connection with the information desired. One, citizenship in Morocco may be said to be governed by the laws pertaining to the same in other countries, with the exception that all persons residing in Morocco who cannot prove foreign citizenship or protection are considered ipso juror as more subjects. All right. So good brother Ilmali Shabazz, commonly known as Malcolm X, talked about nationalism. He talked about independence, right? He talked about Africa and China, and Africa and China established constitutions. And through those constitutions, those constitutions claimed their own. They allowed the Africans to do what? Repatriate back to being Africans instead of being slaves and colonized people of France, right? Dutch, Germany. Italy, Spain, Great Britain, and all the rest, right? So the Africans reclaim their own. Now listen. Section one. Citizenship in Morocco may be said to be governed by laws pertaining to the same in other countries. So listen to what they said. Earlier they said there is no citizenship in Morocco. Right? Now so in section one they say citizenship in Morocco. Well wait a minute. First they say there's no citizenship in Morocco. Now they're saying there's citizenship in Morocco. Well, what happened? 
We became citizens because we're naturalized. It's a paperwork thing. It's a cheap and hypothecation of paperwork that's making us citizens. Our consanguineous Moroccans in Morocco, but we've been subjugated and naturalized in their jurisdiction because they have what? Constitutions in the state. What don't we have? Constitution in a state. So now so we're citizens of their laws. They established laws that made us citizens. Listen, section one. Citizenship in Morocco may be said to be governed by the laws pertaining to the same in other countries, with the exception that all persons residing in Morocco who cannot prove foreign citizenship or protections are considered if so jurors Moorish subjects, right? So what are they saying? If Moors can't prove foreign citizenship, right, in a different country, let's say Moors went to Mexico and got Mexican naturalization status, Mexico will represent that more. Or right here, or protection. Protection by who? The Moroccan government, right? Protection by who? The Moroccan government. Treaty of Madrid, right? Article 15, paragraph 1. Now, once you make your choice, you choose between the entire submission of the law of the empire. Now, so you come under what? The protection of what? The government of Morocco. That's where you get your protections from. You understand? Okay, let's go back. So, Morris have to even prove, if you cannot prove foreign citizenship or protections, then immediately you just considered an if so juror more subject. And if you are considered an if so juror, meaning a fact, a more subject, then guess what? Now you come back over. Madrid Convention, paragraph two. Foreign naturalization hereto acquired by subjects of Morocco, Moroccan subjects, according to the rules established by the United States of America's laws shall we continue to United States of America regards all its effects without any restriction. Go back to Alfred Philip. So he said, these Moors have established their own state, their Moorish government, right? They have to do it, and they are still considered, if so juror, as more subjects. And the United States of America still got jurisdiction over them. Section two and three, no. Two and three. Moorish subjects lost their nationality only by becoming naturalized in or protected by another country having treaty relations with the Moorish Empire. They tell you the whole story right there. That's that easy. Moors have been reading this for decades. Section two and three. Moorish subjects lost their nationality. Hmm, I wonder what their nationality is that they lost. It was Moroccan. It's Moroccan. Now they call the Moors what? Former Moors. Resolution 75 of 1933. They call the Moors former Moors. Why do they call them former Moors? Because now you're just a citizen of the United States of America. They want to call you American. That's why in Resolution 75, they call you what? A speedy and thorough what? Americanization of these former Moors. Section 2 and 3. More subjects lost their nationality of Moroccan only by becoming naturalized and becoming Americans in or protected by, now we're protected by who? United States of America. United States of America got, got what? Treaty relations with the Moors, i.e. the Moroccan Empire. But listen, then it turned around and gave the Moors the answer to the test. This is the most egregious part right here. Now they're going to tell you how we lost our nationality. <laughs> right here, no. It was. It was established by the Convention of Madrid, concluded on July 3rd of 1880, as follows. Article 15. 15. Any subject of Morocco who has been naturalized in a foreign country and who shall return to Morocco shall, after having remained for a length of time, equal to that which shall have been regularly necessary for him to obtain such naturalization, choose between entire submission to the laws of the empire and the obligation to quit Morocco, 
unless it shall be proved that his naturalization in a foreign country was obtained with the consent of the government of Morocco. Foreign naturalization heretofore acquired by subjects of Morocco according to the rules established by the laws of each country shall be continued to here him. Oh, to him, him. As, head him as regards all its effects without any restriction. So they turn around and copy paste it and put the answer to the test right there. <laughs> so these more have lost their nationality because they're more subjects according to what? Treaties. Treaty of Madrid. Treaty of Madrid. Article 15. They put it right in front of our faces. More than looking at this for decades. So then the Americans, right, turn around and added insult to injury. They put it right in front of our faces. Then they added insult to injury. No. The above ruling has never yet been acted upon, and should this at any time be contemplated seriously, a large number of naturalized people, American and others residing in Morocco, would be affected thereby. Pause. Are you hearing what's happening? Listen. The above ruling, what about ruling? Article 15 of Treaty Madrid. The above ruling has never yet been enacted upon. And should this at any time be contemplated seriously by the Moors, a large number of naturalized Moors, people, naturalized people, who are the naturalized ones? Moors. They're talking about you. Americans. Who are the Americans? The citizens, United States Americans. The treaty of peace and friendship between who? Moors and Americans. So they say, who's going to be affected? Naturalized Moors. And the Americans of the United States of America and others, who are the others? Everybody who's come over here got a visa. Everybody who's naturalized, this is the Italians, everyone who comes over here, including Africans, anybody who comes to the jurisdiction of the United States of America, will be affected because now Moroccan law kicks in. Let's take from the top. The above ruling has never been acted upon, and should this at any time be contemplated seriously, a large number of naturalized Moors, the Americans, and others residing in Morocco. Did they say residing in America? Say so residing in Morocco, the Empire of Morocco will be affected thereby. Everybody will be affected. Why? Because everybody will come under what? The civil and criminal jurisdiction of Moorish courts. That's why. And everybody got to pay taxes to who? The Moorish state government and its treasury. That's why they got to contemplate it seriously. Section 4 and 5. Four and five, residence in foreign parts does not affect the nationality of Moorish subjects, and the Moorish government has no means of protecting its subjects permanently residing in other countries, with the exception of a so-called Moorish consul at Gibraltar and a Moorish agent at Cairo, Egypt. Oh, that's that Cairo, Egypt. Hmm, I wonder why Malcolm was hanging out at Cairo, Egypt. Okay, section four and five. Listen, talking nationality. Residence in foreign parts does not affect the nationality of more subject. Let's pause right there. You see what they use this word right here, residence? What does residence mean? A temporary stay. Dorothy was in the land of Oz temporarily. She was naturalized in Oz. Residence means temporary, like residence in, like a hotel. You're there temporarily. Section 4 and 5, residence in a foreign part, right? Oz, I mean, Dorothy was a resident in a foreign part. And it does not affect the nationality of more subjects. What was the nationality of more subjects? Moroccans. Because it's what? Your consanguinity. You are native to the land of Morocco. You've always been Moroccans and you've always been, been Moroccans. And whoever told you American is lying to you. No, what Ali said, we're descendants of Moroccans, naturalized in America's jurisdiction. What jurisdiction? Their state constitution jurisdiction. You're supposed to return back to your Moroccan state constitution, just like this. You're back in Morocco. You want to go back to America? Do like this. You go back to America. You get sick and tired of America? Come on back to Morocco. Guess who was doing that? 
Neo in the Matrix. This is a story about the Moors. Going back and forth through a portal to different jurisdictions. Section 4 and 5, residents temporary stay in a foreign country, such as the United States of America's jurisdiction, does not affect the nationality of Moroccans who have been subjugated. And the Moorish government, what type of Moorish government? Moroccan government has no means of protecting its subjects permanently residing in other countries. So now they're talking about permanently residing, right? So notice they went from residency to permanent. You see their choice of words? Okay, what subjects are permanently residing in other countries? More subjects. More subjects. They're permanently. What do I mean? What makes you permanent? After five years. Yeah, well, after five years, you're just kind of stuck. Right? So what does that mean? If you fail to return to Morocco, you have permanently decided to stay in that land, in that foreign jurisdiction. It's a permanent stay. This is why you got to look up the difference between immigration with an I and immigration with an E. Immigrant with an I means you're passing through, you're resident. Immigration with an E means what? You're seeking a permanent residency. Even though those two words don't belong in the same sentence, but they call it permanent residency. That's the word they use. It's an oxymoron, but that's how they talk. You're seeking a permanent residency residency in another country. Now you become what? An expatriate, expat. You gotta understand what's happening. Take it from the top. Four and five. Residents in a foreign part, right, so the Moors had a temporary stay in the United States of America, does not affect the nationality of Moroccan subjects and the Moroccan government has no means of protecting its subjects permanently residing in other countries abroad, such as in the far west, that's commonly known as the United States. The Moors didn't have no way of protecting ourselves. Why? Because we didn't have our governments together over here. We got usurped. We couldn't protect ourselves. Even though the Sultan signed the treaty in 1906, he, they told France to do what? Help the Moors do what? Have reforms to reestablish themselves in their governments. And the Moors didn't do it in 1906 because France and Spain didn't help the Moors to bounce back into their governments. So what happened in 1912? Treaty of Fez, 1912, France comes in and starts acting like the Sultan and acting like Moors to govern the great enterprise of the Empire of Morocco. Take it from the top. Four or five, residents in foreign parts does not affect the nationality of Moroccan subjects, and the Moroccan government has no means of protecting its subjects permanently residing in the United States of America with the exception of a so-called Moorish consul at Gibraltar and a Moorish agent at Cairo, Egypt. Didn't Noble Drali come over here talking to us about Gibraltar? Didn't Noble Drali come over here talking about Egypt? You gotta understand what's happening here, Moors. The, the answer to the test been in front of our faces the whole time. Listen, we're gonna read over a case. It's only four pages. What is this? Moore Science Temple of America versus New Jersey. Year 2005. But that's not the full name of the case. Let me show you the full name of the case. Full title, The Great Seal, More Science Temple of America, Incorporated. Who does that belong to? Taj Bay. This is a case that dealt with Taj Bay in the year 2005, right? United States District Court, right? Published September 28, 2005. All right? So what's the real name of the plaintiff? The Great Seal. More Science Temple of America Incorporated. Incorporated. But wait, I, I thought, how can you enforce anything against the United States of America trying to fight as a corporation? And let me say this for the record, and, and this is not like an attack on Taj. But come on, man. 
You can't say you got the great seal and then tie it to the more science temple talking about your civic more. Come on, Todd. You already know the more science temple want to stick with their church processes. When you tie civics to the more science temple, you make all the temples now look like they're all doing the same sovereign citizen packages. That's not good. Just be great seal, brother, and leave it that of America Incorporated. Be the great seal of America Incorporated because you keep telling more of the Americans. Let's look at this case. Okay, so it's the Moore Science Temple of America versus New Jersey. All right, you go look that up. Okay, that's this case right here. Okay. More Science Temple of America versus Jersey, but they know they don't put the whole name. Okay, it's a great seal, it's Todd's work. Okay, we're going to read this, it's four pages. Now, before we get started, here's something I need you to understand. As we read this, the judges are absolutely insulting Todd. This is what you got to pick up on. They, they're looking at Todd's competency of how he's writing and they're talking a lot of smack to him. Why is that? For two reasons. One, evidently he turned in a document that's lacking in competency and two, they know who Taj B. Bay is. They want to let him know, man, you're supposed to be the best civic more ever and this is what you turned in? Now let's, let's get our concepts and, and concepts and context correct. When was the Great Seal established? From my understanding, it was established, what, 1980? This case came out in 2005. Let's do the math. That's 25 years. 25 years of studying so-called civics. And this is what Taj put together. This is a summary page. This is the judge talking. Okay, no. Memorandum and order. Gene Prater, District Judge. One, factual background. The Great Seal Moorish Science Temple of America Incorporated and other related entities, the Moors, filed the present civil action against various defendants inter alia, the state of New Jersey, the Asbury Park Police Department, including individual members of the police department, here and after collectively the Asbury defendants, and the Wall Township Police Department, including members of the police department, here and collectively the Wall defendants arising out of incidents that allegedly occurred between some of the defendants and an individual or individuals belonging to the Moore's organization representing the plaintiff here, the no, Moore. Pause. Now, know what they call the Moore's organization. Why are they call the Moore's organization? Because Taj wrote his what? Moore Science Temple of Incorporated. Taj ain't claiming to be what? A part of a state. He's not claiming to be the common authority of a state. He's trying to fight them as a corporation. 25 years he's been studying at this point. Continue. Uh, the Morris complaint is extremely vague and the exact causes of action for which the Morris seek relief is unclear. Essentially, the complaint makes no logical sense. It is much as it is a random rendition bordering on a mishmash of legalese turned into meaningless meanderings. You see what's happening? The federal court, they talking smack to Todd. It's what you call being facetious. What does facetious mean? Being serious and funny at the same time. They smacking Todd around in this document. This is after 25 years of his studies. The federal court, this is how they're talking to him. They're daring him. Because they recognize that Todd don't know what he's talking about. And I say that respectfully because we got to tell the truth. Even Todd said the truth don't require no apology. And look how the federal courts are talking to him. The court said his document had no logical sense. And then his document is mishmash. What does that mean? Gibberish. It's meaningless. They said his document was absolutely meaningless. 25 years he'd been studying at that time. Okay, let's continue. One, the Moorish Science Temple of America was founded by Timothy Drew, a.k.a. Noble Drew Ali, in 1913. See 
the HTP website. The more members of Plaintiff the Great Seal 7 appear to be followers of Drew's teachings. Drew preached that all African Americans are of Moorish descendant or de descent and thus are not citizens of the United States, case law. Uh, Drew instructed his followers that all Moorish Americans must carry a Moorish passport bearing one's real name, which was often created fictitiously by adding names that Drew claimed co corresponded to the three ancient Moroccan tribes, Ali, Bey, and El, to one's given birth name, case law. Paul, now why did the court say they were established fictitiously? Because no state recognized the Owls, Eels, and Bays. The court's telling the truth. It's fictitious if the state didn't issue these identification cards. You gotta catch what's being said here. Moors will say, oh man, those courts, they, they, they're criminals. No, they're telling you the truth. Your identification card was not issued from a state. It came from Artie Bay Publications or it came from the temple and the temple was not a state government. I say that respectfully, but it's the truth. The temple don't have no three branches of government. The temple don't have no sultan, no wazir, no prime minister. The temple don't have a legislative branch and a speaker of the house. They don't pass bills and laws. They don't have no judicial branch. The temple's not a state. And neither is already made publications. It's fictitious. Listen. The Moors claimed certain rights as a result of the Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1786 entered into by the United States of America and the Kingdom of Morocco. The treaty. According to the Moors, the treaty subjects them only to the laws of Morocco, including the taxing provisions. Now you see how the federal courts are saying they're talking about this treaty again. Guess who was playing the same playbook? Rodney Burton Bay. Doesn't it sound familiar? Rodney's case is in 2021. This case in 2005. Similar language. Moors are running the playbook. And they keep trying to invoke treaties, but treaties are only between states. Taj has not returned back to Morocco and pledges allegiance to a Moroccan state. So he's still what? Naturalized in a foreign country. But he keeps invoking treaties. You can't invoke treaties when you're still naturalized. You can only invoke treaties when you return back to your Moroccan state and then your state invokes the treaty against the United States of America. Right? State on state. That's Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1. Everybody keeps talking about enforce the Constitution. I can't tell that y'all been studying it. Where's your state? Let's continue. Moreover, the Morris did not believe that African Americans were technically citizens of the United States. Within the meaning of the United States Constitution, as a result of many of the Morris predecessors being brought to the United States as slaves. Pause. Why do Morris talk like this? Moreover. The Moors do not believe that African Americans are technically citizens of the United States within the meaning of the United States Constitution. Pause. See, Tashmi Bay, don't, he don't teach about the Treaty of Madrid of 1880, does he? So this is why the Moors keep talking about the Constitution, because they don't study international law. They never took the time to read the Treaty of Madrid of 1880, Article 15. The treaty is what's giving the United States jurisdiction over Moors. Not their constitution. Hoffman Phillips talked about this in 1906. He said, the United States has various treaties and conventions with the Moorish Empire. How, and then he says, the Moors lost their nationality by what? Being naturalized. How were we naturalized? Okay, here it is. For the record, again. You were naturalized. Foreign naturalization heretofore acquired by subject of Morocco according to the rules established by the laws of each country shall continue to them as regards all its effects without any restriction. Paragraph 2 of a treaty of Madrid, Article 15. But what does the Moors keep rambling about? Here's what they keep rambling about. They keep talking about the United States Constitution. Instead of talking about the treaties. Morris are making mistakes. This is why they go to jail. They don't know what the heck they're talking about. And I love all the Moors, but we've been miseducated. Let's continue. Thus, in 
Thus, they contend that descendants of slaves are not subject to the laws established pursuant to the Constitution. Paul, so what are the Moors subject to? Treaties. We're subject according to treaties. We're subjugated because of the treaties. We're naturalized because of the treaties. We're citizens because of the treaties. Public Law 856 said what? The United States of America has jurisdiction is authorized by what? Treaty. Moors also believe that the Dred Scott decision, Scott versus Sanford uh, case law, stands for the proposition that African Americans are not citizens of the United States and thus the duties of citizens, including abiding by the laws of the United States and paying taxes. Paul, look what Tosterick Bay is invoking, Dred Scott case. Dred Scott case went to the Supreme Court in 1856. It was settled in 1857. What happened after 1857? 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment, Naturalization Act of 1870, and then what happened, what happened after that? I'll go back to it. Treaty of Madrid. Yeah, Treaty of Madrid, Todd. A treaty came out in 1880, Todd. So to talk about Dred Scott is irrelevant. A treaty Supreme Law of Land. So just because it said in the Dred Scott case that Dred Scott couldn't be a citizen, now all of a sudden, Todd says, no one can be a citizen because of the Dred Scott case. That's not true, Todd. The treaty is given the United States of America jurisdiction over all Moors that have what? Acquiesce. Paying taxes do not apply to African Americans. Case law. Where the defendant offered a defense that his ancestors came from Africa, thus he was a Moorish national required to obey only the laws mentioned in the treaty. Recently, within the jurisdiction of this circuit, Moors adherents have been convicted of creating fictitious money orders and checks that were purportedly authorized by the Department of the Treasury and the Department of Transportation. Case law. The defendant convicted of trying to pass fake Department of Treasury checks for $25 million, case law, United States versus Harris. Defendants in southern New Jersey created thousands of fictitious money orders for more than $50 million in alleged scam victimizing banks, utilities, lenders, and a casino, case law. Unfortunately, all of the Moore's filings in this case were virtually unintelligible. You see that? They say that Todd's document turned in lacks intelligence. That's a huge slap in the face. Someone who's been studying for 25 years. Look how they're coming at Todd. They know Todd is what? Stateless. They know Todd is what? A more subject. They know Todd is what? Naturalized. They know Todd is still a citizen of the United States, and Todd B. Bay comes under the civil and criminal jurisdiction of the United States of America. That's why they're talking to him like this. The allegations in the complaint seem to stem from the impounding of a vehicle allegedly owned by an individual with the given name of Lee Sean, quote, a.k.a. Lord Noble Nature L. Bay. While the complaint fails to comport with anything approaching standard pleading procedures and contains no references to an individual plaintiff or discrete actions causing harm or damage, plaintiffs appear to allege violations of federal law, among other things, violations of civil rights, racketeering, kidnapping, conspiracy, and high treason. Pause. Tosh Bay said that Moors are not citizens of the United States of America. Then why does Tosh keep teaching everybody to enforce the Constitution? How can you say the United States of America who is citizens of the United States of America are violating your rights as a Moor that's of a separate jurisdiction? You gotta understand what I'm saying. Moors are saying, I'm not a citizen, so they said I'm over here, out of that jurisdiction, but yet keep invoking the laws of the United States of America to tell the United States of America, you violate my rights. Even though your rights are supposed to be of Morocco. And you keep jumping over here in America telling America, you better do what I tell you, but oh, by the way, I'm not in your jurisdiction. 
But since I don't have my own state and I don't have my own laws, I don't have my own judge, I don't have my own prime minister, I don't have my own speaker of the house and legislative branch, I'm going to keep trying to enforce your laws and tell you how to treat me. All because I'm stateless. So it's an oxymoron, it's a contradiction to keep saying you're not a citizen of the United States of America, but yet you keep trying to enforce the American's constitution to get your remedy. This don't make sense. Most don't realize it, but they are admitting by default that they are stateless and don't have their own Moroccan laws. But plaintiffs do identify each of the defendants in the complaint. From reading the complaint, the court can divine that each of the defendants are citizens of the state of New Jersey. You see what the federal court just did? It's naming the parties. It said, no, these more right in this document are Americans. They are naturalized, more subjects in the jurisdiction of the United States of America. And their birth certificate or their permanent residence is New Jersey and it is not Morocco. Because Todd ain't even talking about a Moroccan state. He ain't talking about a Moroccan constitution. He ain't invoking Article 15 of the Treaty of Madrid. He's not proving anything about who he is or who the rest of the defendants are. He hasn't introduced any evidence. Now, don't get me wrong, it's a summary, but the courts would have mentioned all these things. But we already know Taj don't have it. Let's start from here. Defendants are citizens of the state of New Jersey, and all of the actions alleged in the complaint appear to refer to events occurring in localities within the state of New Jersey. Asbury Park is a municipality within the state of New Jersey. Wall Township also is a municipality within the state of New Jersey. Because of the nearly unintelligible nature of the verbiage contained in the complaint, the causes of action that the Moors attempt to bring or assert are not apparent. Nevertheless, it appears from the face of the complaint and a plain reading of it that no defendant is a citizen of Pennsylvania and none of the alleged acts took place within the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. All right, so once again, they're insulting Todd, right? <laughs> Unintelligible nature of the verbiage. The court said, man, we can't even understand what the heck he's talking about. It lacks incompetency. You claim it not to be a citizen of the United States of America, then why don't you write like a dignitary of a foreign state? How would a dignitary deal with what's called the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations of 1963? How would a minister of foreign affairs write? How would a consul general write? How would an ambassador write, right? Listen. Isn't this what the Moors keep talking about? Enforce the Constitution. Okay, how would an ambas ambassador write of Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1? How would a minister of foreign affairs write of Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1? How would a consul general write of Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1? This is why the court is clowning talk. They said, Man, the way you wrote it, we can't even understand what you're talking about. You don't write like a dignitary. And you, you don't even write like a competent attorney or barrister of the United States either. This, this is the federal courts. I don't say this to be an antagonist against Taj. We're reading documentary evidence. This is for the record, 2005. The Morris keeps saying enforce the Constitution, and we don't know how dignitaries write. Continue. To initiate this legislation, the Morris filed a document entitled Petition for Writ of Mandamus. In class action, here and after the complaint. Pause. Lord have mercy. Listen, Morris. This is Todd's rightness. Listen to what the, the judge said, the federal judge says. To initiate this lit litigation, the Moors filed, right? Taj filed a document entitled Petition for Writ of Mandamus. We all hear Taj talk about this, right? Okay, what's a writ of mandamus? <laughs> no. Uh, we command. Mandamus is a Latin word that means we command. It is a writ or order from a higher court to a lower court, a public official or a public authority. 
it requires them to do or not to do a specific act that the law obliges them to do or not to do. It is used when there is a legal right that is denied by someone who has a legal duty. It is an extraordinary remedy that is only available when all other judicial remedies fail. Okay, so Taj wrote this, petition a writ of mandamus, and who can write a writ of mandamus? Only higher, higher court. courts to a lower court. Is, is Taj saying he a judge now? But Taj taught all the Moors to write this like all the Moors are judges. This is why they, through our eBay publication, they put the word judicial notice. Everybody's a judge, huh? <laughs> well, I can't wait to see all those public inaugurations of all those judges that took their oath to the state. That's going to be thousands of them. Because everybody's a judge. Ain't nobody the prime minister. Nobody's the legislative branch. Everybody's a judge, including Taj. Taj wrote this. This is why the court's laughing at him. They said, this man don't know what he's talking about. He, he's not the competent authority of the state. Okay, let's go back to Article 3. Article 3 says what? Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1. More saying, what is the Constitution? It says the judicial power. It's talking about judicial power in Article 3. Okay, then here comes Todd. He's trying to use judicial power, petition or writ of mandamus, and he's not a judge. That's absolute incompetency. And to tell you the truth, it's fraud. It's impersonating a public official. This is why the judge is talking to him like this. Now it's about to, it's about to disclose who wrote this document. The Asbury Park Police Department thereafter filed a motion to dismiss. Docket, two num docket number two, Moore, Minister Taj Tariq Bey filed a motion in opposition and opposing Asbury defendant's motion to dismiss. So he's writing it like he's a judge. No, I blocked your motion to dismiss. I'm a judge, and we're going to continue on with these proceedings. This is why this judge is clowning Taj. Continue. Uh, number docket number five, defendants Sosidian, Boyles, and Spalina, all of whom are individual officers of the Asbury Park Police Park Police Department, filed a motion to join the Asbury Park motion to dismiss. Docket number eight, the Moors then filed a summary judgment motion with exhibits. Pause. So then Taj turns around and submits a summary judgment. He still acting like a judge. This is why the federal courts is laughing at him. This is shameful. And this is what Todd has taught all the Moors to do. And this is why all the Moors are on a conveyor belt straight to jail. They think they can dismiss stuff, default judgment, writ of mandamus, like we're judges. You got to be the common authority of your state. You got to be elected judge by your state. In order to have a state, you got to have to have a constitution. And that constitution has to be ratified, deposited, and promulgated in accordance to international law. And then you must accede to treaties and become a party to the treaties in order to enforce said treaties. And those treaties have to be deposited with who? The United Nations, in accordance to Article 102, to let them know you become a party to the treaties. You can't talk about treaties unless you become a party to it. Tashiri Bay. It's not a party to the treaties. Why do I say that? Because only a state can be a party to the treaties. Then the common authority of the state can enforce the treaty through the state. Todd is not a judge. This is why Morris is going to jail, because of these false teachings. Uh, docket 10, docket number 10, the Walt defendants filed a motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. Pause. Now they're filing a a document for lack of jurisdiction to dismiss. You can't do that unless you're a judge. Docket number 12, finally, the Moores filed Amendment 9 complaint at law. Pause. What's Amendment 9? What is an Amendment 9? Todd is invoking the United States of America's Amendment 9, but he says he's not a citizen of the United States of America. Then why are you trying to use their Constitution? But while we're talking about it, what's Amendment 9? The Ninth Amendment simplified is that the federal government doesn't own the rights that are not listed in the Constitution. 
but instead they belong to citizens. Pause. But he said he's not a citizen of the United States. But right here, Article 9 is about what? The Ninth Amendment simplified is that the federal government does not own the rights that are not listed in the Constitution, but instead they belong to the citizens. But Todd, you say you're not a citizen. Well, simultaneously trying to invoke Amendment Number 9 is if you're what? Citizen. This is a contradiction, and this is why the judge is clowning him. And this is what Arby Bay Publications and unfortunately good brother Toshby Bay is teaching Moors. And Moors are in fellowship instead of scholarship. Look how easy I'm looking this stuff up. Isn't this easy? So let's finish the reading. This means the rights that are specified in the Constitution are not the only ones people should be living it to. The amendment was added to the Constitution in 1791 as part of the Bill of Rights. The first time the Supreme Court used the amendment to define an unenumerated right was in 1965 in the case of Griswold versus Connecticut, which involved the right to privacy. Right, so Todd is trying to invoke the United States of America's Constitution while simultaneously saying he's not a citizen of the United States of America, which means you can't invoke the United States of America's Constitution if you're not a citizen of the United States of America. Defendants have moved to dismiss the complaint pursuant to Fed R Civ P 12B. Now it appears that the instant matter may be dismissed pursuant to Rule 12B 1 3 and 6, as well as pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 1915 E2, dismissal for frivolity. All right, so the court said we're going to dismiss this because it's frivolous. You see, wait, hold up. What does that mean? Frivolity, no. Frivolity, noun, lack of seriousness, lightheartedness, a night of fun and frivolity. Similar are lightheartedness, levity, joking, joke clarity, gaiety, fun, frivolousness, silliness, foolishness, zaniness, giddiness, fightiness, skittishness, flippancy, facetiousness, inanity, superficiality. See, he's being facetious. He's clowning talk. This is 25 years of Todd's studies from 1980 to 2005. This is documentary evidence. Two, procedural challenges to the complaint. Rule 12B1 permits the court to dismiss a claim for a lack of jurisdiction. Rule 12B3 permits dismissal for improper venue. Rule 12B6 permits the court to dismiss all or part of an action for failure to state a claim upon which Relief can be granted additionally pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 1915-E2, notwithstanding any fi filing. A civil action wherein jurisdiction is not found solely on diversity of citizenship may, except as otherwise provided by law, be brought only in one, a jurisdiction or judicial court where any defendant resides, if all defendants reside in the same state, Two, judicial district in which a substantial part of the events or omissions giving rise to the claim occurred, or a substantial part of property that is subject to the action is situated, or three, a judicial district in which any defendant may be found if there is no district in which the action may otherwise be brought. Here, using the framework of section 1391B, it is clear that no defendant resides in this judicial district. Two, neither the events nor omissions giving rise to the allegations nor any property involved in the instant dispute occurred or exist within the judicial district. And three, none of the defendants can be found in this judicial district. Accordingly, venue is improper in the instant matter. Plaintiff's complaint refers entirely to New Jersey actions and indicates that each of the named defendants are New Jersey residents or entities. Plaintiff's complaint is devoid of any factual or legal basis that connects it to Pennsylvania. Based on these uncontroverted 
considerations, all of which emanate from plaintiff's own filings, defendants have met their burden of proving that venue is improper case law. The court finds nothing in the complaint to be merit transfer to the District of New Jersey rather than outright dismissal of the action. Therefore, this matter shall be dismissed pursuant to Rule 12b1, 3, and 6, 28 U.S.C. 1391b, and 28 U.S.C. 1406a. Because the court has decided that it is without jurisdiction to hear the merits of the case, the court declines to consider the Moore's motion for summary judgment, which is as unintelligible as their other filings. For a conclusion, venue is improper in this court and in violation of 28 U.S.C. 1391b. There are no facts that would support finding either jurisdiction or venue in this court. Additionally, the Moore's motion for summary judgment is denied inasmuch as it is not only appears without merit, but because the language constraint contained therein is unfocused and unintelligible. Finally, because the complaint appears both frivolous, unintelligible, and without merit, this entire matter is dismissed with prejudice pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 1915 E2. Boy, they talking big smacky talk. 1980 to the year 2005, 25 years of studying so-called civics, and this is how the federal courts is talking to him. This is shameful, and I'll and I tell you the truth, I feel bad for Taj. I'm sure when he, he received this in 2005, they, they smacked him up so bad, he just, he just had to bow his head and dip. Trust me when I tell you, there was no comeback from this. They both said, hit whatever he submitted was unintelligible, it was both frivolous, unintelligible, and without merit. Why is it without merit? Because he ain't the common authority of the state. I mean, surely ain't a judge. Order. And now this 28th day of September of 2005, upon consideration of the Morris petition for a writ of mandamus in class action, the complaint, docket number one, the Asbury Park motion to dismiss, docket number two, more minister to... Taj Tariq Bay's motion in opposition, docket number five, defendants, so Sidian, Royals, and Spalina's motion to join the Asbury Park motion to dismiss, docket number eight, the more summary judgment motion with exhibits, docket number 10, the Wall Township Police Department, Sergeant Lancelotti, and Sergeant Broccoli's motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction, docket number 12, and the Moore's Amendment uh, 9 complaint at law, docket number 14. It is hereby ordered that the Moore's summary judgment motion, docket number 10, is denied. The motions to dismiss, docket number 2, uh, 5, 8, 12, are granted. Uh, 3, the complaint, docket number 1, is dismissed with prejudice. And 4, all remaining motions are dismissed. The clerk shall mark this, clay, this case as close. It is ordered. It is so ordered. Mm -hmm. So what happened? It, it, not only did they dismiss the case, look at this. They, they dismissed this case with prejudice. Right? Let me, let me go back to it. They dismiss it with prejudice. Number three, the complaint docket number one is dismissed with prejudice. Do more know what that means, with prejudice? So there are two st uh, statuses. You can say with prejudice, or you can say without prejudice. What does with prejudice mean? That means that Todd's couldn't even appeal it to the Supreme Court. They shut him down. They won't let him appeal it even to the Supreme Court. They shut him down, so it's frivolous. If, if the courts would have said without prejudice, that means you can appeal it to a higher court. That means after this, Tosh can do nothing. He was shut down. What's the main reason why Tosh was shut down? Let me tell you the main reason why Tosh was shut down. It's this right here. More Science Temple America 
is really what? Corporation. Taj wasn't affiliated with a state. The feds couldn't have talked to him like that if he was a state representative. Because immediately, if he was a state representative of a Moroccan state, guess what Taj would have been invoking? He would have been invoking this right here. To, con to con controversies between two or more states. Then he would invoke what? He would have been what? The ambassador, public minister, or consul, or maybe even the judicial power to have authority over the treaties to settle the case. But he was none of the above. And all the more was think they can walk in the footsteps of Tosh Bay, and you're walking right into the same thing he walked into, which is judges laughing at you, which means they're laughing at all of us because all the more is in this together. How they treat Taj is how they're treating us. And we're all in this together. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all in this together. So even though it may look like I'm being condescending towards Taj, but the reality is I'm not. I feel sorry for the good brother. He's been trying his hardest. But unfortunately, Taj is miseducated. And he's miseducated the rest of us. And that has created negligence and punitive damages. Now keep in mind, with this, that, that whole case was about what? Somebody's car got towed or something. And the feds just came in and just slapped Todd up and said, you the best that the Moors got to offer? That's sad. I feel sorry for you, good brother. But we're going to fix this, good brother Todd. We're going to fix it. All right, as I'm starting to close out, keep in mind what I have up on the board. This is what Todd should be teaching right here. Todd had an issue. He, he was trying to settle a dispute, right? But what did good brother Malik Shabazz say we need? Okay, he said what? Il Malik Shabazz, commonly known as Malcolm X, was on a path to independence and nationalism through the United Nations organs. Malcolm studied Africa and China's statehood claims of independence and acts of decolonization. And what is it that Malcolm, i.e. Il Malik, wanted everybody to do because he's on the path to the United Nations? Well, when I started studying United Nations and I started studying international law, I realized what? That we need state constitutions in order to have independence. It's all about constitutions, Moses. That way you can be the common authority of your state. And then your state becomes your representative. We have three branches of government and AMPAC as an example. So I say to the good brother Tosh Bay, I extend my hand in fellowship to you, good brother. We got to change the education of the Moroccan Empire. It's time for you to course correct, good brother. I, I love you. I, I, I have both arms out to you. But as you can see, you've been getting your keister kicked, and so have your students. It's time for us to teach the right history about the Moors. So I'm willing to work with you, good brother. All right? I am with that. Islam. 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 Islam.